Okie dokie. Uh, so, uh, my name is Steve Collins. I'm an engineer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, here in uh, Pasadena, really in La Cunada, Flint Ridge. Um, I'm a spacecraft engineer. I've worked there for about 22 years. Um, I, I uh, you may recognize me from the uh, Curiosity Mars landing as being uh, the guy that was sitting a couple of seats over from the guy with the mohawk. <laughs> Um, I've been uh, doing hacking since uh, basically day one. Um, is this, uh, how's the focus on that? Is that sort of, okay. Um, you, you can uh, see me there uh, in the upper left uh, watching the uh, first moon landing. And, uh, and right by me there is my oldest surviving tool, which is a uh, completely polished, smooth uh, file that uh, my, uh, my parents got me uh, in a little uh, kit of, uh, of woodworking tools. And I used it to file pretty much everything for the first 20 years of my life. Um, uh, next is a picture of me riding my bicycle. Uh, and, uh, and then down below, you see that same bicycle after I had uh, welded a sidecar on the side of it. Um, and uh, I did that by uh, fishing every coat hanger out of my parents' uh, closet and uh, got somebody uh, that was crazy enough to rent me a welding torch. Uh, and, uh, and we went to town with a tubing cutter and a bunch of uh, plain steel tubing. And uh, I just kept adding gussets to things until it was uh, strong enough not to break. And so that was uh, an early... Uh, an early example of uh, playing with hardware. Um, I uh, didn't exactly move, but I also uh, uh, m moved in some sense into electronics. I started doing electronic stuff. My parents got me one of these things from Radio Shack that you see in the upper left-hand corner, which is a little uh, kit of electronics pieces that you can connect by sticking wires and little springs. And it would come with a book that uh, had all kinds of different designs of electronic stuff. You could build a crystal radio and a light that would blink on and off and run a relay and make the meter measure things. And, um, and so I started playing with that stuff and basically, you know, figuring out how this electricity stuff works. And I graduated from that into uh, these uh, electronics books that are, uh, were published by Radio Shack uh, by a guy named Forrest Mims, who had these great, uh, yeah, wherever you are out there, Forrest, you're amazing. Because he had these great uh, hand-drawn uh, pictures of, uh, of circuits and uh, little examples of things you could do with different chips that Radio Shack sold. And you could basically go to Radio Shack and get, get the, all the pieces that you need to build these circuits and, uh, and screw around with it. And that uh, evolved into a lifetime of building things like you see on the left, which is a little point-to-point -point wired uh, 555 thing that it, it's basically like a uh, TV be gone. It uh, makes a little set of pulsed IR, but what that thing uh, specifically was built for was for playing laser tag. Uh, I, I went and got a scope and I measured what the signal was when you got hit with one of these laser tag guns, and so I made this box that just emitted that over and over and over again. <laughs> so this was an aerial denial landmine for laser tag, you could turn it on, set it up on a on a shelf somewhere, and when somebody ran through while you were playing laser tag, they get totally uh, they get totally blasted. <laughs> Um, I also uh, uh, did stuff uh, around uh, the motion picture industry. My father was a cinematographer, and so I grew up around cameras and watching him build mounts for cameras and stuff like that. Um, up in the upper left, you see a, um, a, a jib arm that I built, which you could put a Super 8 camera on and do, uh, you know, tabletop moves and stuff like that. Um, the, uh, the VCR in the center there, you can see see there's some wires hanging out of the side of it. 
and those are uh, wires that I added. I put an optical interrupter uh, in there attached to one of the little uh, the little uh, wheels that run the tape in this VCR machine, and that would plug into my Amiga uh, and look to the Amiga like it was a mouse, which uh, back in the day uh, didn't have an optical sensor in them, but actually had a, a quadrature um, infrared sensor in them. And so I could use that to uh, to do editing on, with this VCR. I could pre-roll it to a location on a tape and and then uh, run it and, and make edits and stuff like that. So I built myself kind of this uh, home uh, editing system. A, a lot of these things that were motivated by like, I don't have the money to spend $1,000 or $2,000 on this thing that I want, but uh, so I'm going to just figure out a way to build it myself. Um, yeah, the Miata there uh, in the upper right is a you know mount that I built for uh, for doing uh, autocross racing to mount a GoPro camera way up high and give kind of a uh, um, first-person shooter uh, you know over the over your head perspective of driving the race car. Um, I worked um, when I was younger, you know, pretty much right after high school and and uh, several years into college for a company called Tyler Camera Systems that built camera mounts for helicopters and um, and you see one of these camera mounts there and I used to go out uh, I used to work in the machine shop and build components for those and the way I got that job was basically because I'd been you know hacking on stuff and welding shit at home and you know teaching myself how to do mechanical stuff and so when I went uh, went and uh, my dad you know recommended me to these guys that build these camera mounts I could walk in there and I could you know know, uh, knew which end of a hacksaw to grab and uh, ended up working in the machine shop and then rigging camera mounts and helicopters. Uh, you see me there on the lower right on uh, the set of the James Bond film Octopussy. Uh, where I went out for a couple of days and, you know, rigged uh, mounts in, uh, in helicopters. Um, on to computer phase of my hacking. Not phase, I'm saying this as though it's time ordered, but it's really all this stuff is mixed together in a lifetime of, like, just getting curious about something and, and like, going and finding out about it. Um, I, I got a Commodore 64 a year or so after they came out, and somehow miraculously, Miraculously, uh, in a Commodore store in, uh, in uh, I think it was in San Jose, I found this book by a guy named uh, Ratio Colin West, which was called Programming the Pet CBM. And it was like all the guts and internals of 6502 assembler, how, how all the uh, memory was mapped on the Commodore 64, what everything did. Not, it didn't actually cover the Commodore 64, but it covered the pet machine machines that were just predecessors to that. And so so that, uh, from that I learned, you see my notes and stuff in the upper right corner there, how to program 6502 assembler. I've got little notes in there where I've penciled in how many instructions, uh, you know, clock cycles the instructions take, because I think I was optimizing some multiply routine or something. And, and in here shows, in 6502 assembler, how do you build a multiplier? Uh, and, you know, divisor and how do you uh, how do you compute a cosine uh, in 6502 assembler? Uh, the, the Commodore 64 was a great platform because it had this parallel port and it had these uh, um, um, uh, ports for a mouse uh, that uh, you know you could put switch inputs to and the parallel port you could you could use it as an input or an output and I used to do stuff like uh, in the bottom left there you see um, that's a that's a printer interface it's a thing that you can stick uh, a um, um, uh, electric typewriter into and it has a little carriage that drives back and forth with some motors and had four fingers and so you could drive it horizontally over to a position on the keyboard and press one of the one of the fingers and it would press the key on the electric typewriter because I really wanted to have a, a, a daisy wheel printer not a dot matrix printer so I could have letter quality printing but I couldn't afford to spend a thousand dollars or whatever they cost 
And so I built an interface to do that with the Commodore 64. Um, I noticed when I was putting this together that there's also a speaker on that little board uh, right here. And I, I remember now that was, there was like a, uh, Radio Shack made a, um, uh, a speech synthesis board and I made the Commodore 64 send stuff to the speech synthesis board so it could say whatever that would do. And that eventually led to getting interested in computer graphics and uh, programming some computer graphics stuff on the Commodore 64. Um, and the, uh, uh, the end result of all of that, and this is probably the key slide of my, of my talk or the summary slide is, you know, knowing that Commodore 64, uh, you know, uh, 6502 assembler stuff led to a whole bunch of other uh, other stuff. I in college I did some work on an Apple II where we uh, used 6502 assembler. We built a computerized lighting board. This is before anybody dreamed such a thing was possible. Or why would you why would you build a computerized lighting board? That you know normally you have a lighting board operator that runs all the dimmers and stuff. And so I built a, a very early system that would let you store lighting cues. Um, on this Apple II on floppy disks, and then you could clock through, you know, press the button and advance to the next queue and that sort of stuff. And, you know, 10 years later, all lighting boards were computer controlled. Um, and I also used the Commodore 64 to do, uh, I, I, I actually have um, jumped back to my educational background. I went to UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in physics and a bachelor's degree in theater arts. And so I was doing the, uh, um, the stuff with the lighting board kind of in the world of the theater art stuff, but I was studying physics and I read a book, uh, the biography of, uh, of Buzz Aldrin, and it talked in there about him doing rendezvous stuff and being an expert in orbital rendezvous, and so I got interested in orbital rendezvous. And so for my physics uh, senior thesis, I decided I wanted to do orbital rendezvous stuff. And so I wrote simulations that would run on the Commodore 64 of, of Orbital Rendezvous and uh, ended up, you know, using that as an important part of my thesis. I actually didn't have a way to print these out and so I, I would make the plots on my, on my Commodore 64 and then I very meticulously trace them, uh, you know, through uh, some, um, onto a piece of paper and then, you know, they would get Xerox composited into my thesis. So the the combination of all that stuff, senior thesis about orbital mechanics, Commodore 64, 6502 assembler stuff, um, got me a job with a small engineering company that was building an educational tool that ran on the Apple II. They wanted, it's, if you can imagine Mathematica that runs on the Apple II, it's kind of what this was. It was a thing to let you do uh, simulations of physics sort of stuff. Um, and in order to do that, we had to do it all in machine language for it to be fast enough. And they said, well, here's a guy that knows 6502 assembler. Uh, he's super cheap because he just, uh, out of college and uh, and he was interested in space stuff and we also do a lot of space stuff and so I worked uh, for this company for about eight years uh, and slowly went from doing this software development stuff to doing more and more space engineering uh, started to do some operations work when they were launching the GPS constellation first putting GPS uh, satellites up and so they we had a, a contract uh, with uh, with a company to uh, support launching the GPS spacecraft. And I said, well, I, I would be interested in doing, you know, space operation stuff. And so I went out to Colorado Springs and got, uh, you know, started punching my ticket with this operations experience that uh, ended up getting me a job at JPL later on. Um, and um, while I was 
once I kind of got in the door at JPL, I mean, as it turned out, that experience at that small company, uh, you know, I had operations experience, I had done a bunch of mission engineering, I knew about horizon sensors, which are um, a particular kind of sensor we use to figure out what the, how the spacecraft is pointing. And uh, one day I was, you know, looked at the newspaper kind of at random and saw a classified ad in there for a job working on a Mars program at JPL that read like line for line like my resume. And, and I was like, well, I, I got to apply for that. It'd be amazing to work at JPL. And I applied for it. And after, you know, a, a long year of kind of waiting and projects being canceled and delays and stuff, I, I got hired at JPL. Um, and once I started working at JPL, kind of in that same time frame, I was working for the small company. I started playing around with the Amiga. You can see my Amiga there has the keyboard ripped out of it so that I could move it around on the desk. And then uh, inside the thing actually has um, boards that were built um, by, by various uh, other folks that were expansions and improvements to the uh, Amiga. Um, on the right-hand side there, that's a 68020. Uh, processor and, and somebody decided to build a board that would let you put this higher, faster, more capability processor and they built the board to support it and it plugged into the um, 68000 slot in the Amiga and it also had a math coprocessor and a bunch of stuff like that and then the on the left hand side is a different board that is a memory expansion for it and so I started playing with these uh, with these uh, expansion things. And you'd get those boards, you know, kind of like you're building these kits. It's a, a printed circuit board and a bag of parts. And you'd have to assemble it and figure out how many weight states you needed for the memory that you were able to find and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, you know, in the lower right-hand corner there is a, a, a picture of an interface that I built, uh, you know, point-to-point -point wiring uh, of a... Um, of a, that let you use PC uh, floppy drives at, with the Amiga. I used to go to science fiction conventions once in a while and, uh, you know, kind of grew up watching the Lost in Space robot do stuff and uh, at one, a science fiction convention one time, I saw Robbie the robot. Somebody had a, a Robbie the robot suit that they had built and I was, man, that is really cool. That would be really fun to have a full robot suit like that. And so um, I kind of started like building these robot full wearable robot suits. The first one I built is the, on the left there. Uh, it was called uh, Probot. Well, there was an earlier, earlier one that was made out of like old sleeping bags and uh, bicycle rims. But um, this one it was called Probot 2. Um, it... Uh, it has, uh, you know, uh, a body that's made out of a uh, cardboard uh, d concrete form and ducting that I got at one of these surplus places in the San Fernando Valley. And I would take uh, pieces of, you know, electronic toys and take them apart and use them to make sound effects and that sort of stuff. Uh, it had a cooling system in it that uh, you could fill up a, a, a little metal can with uh, ice and there was a fan that would blow uh, air over the ice and into the suits to kind of help keep you cool. Um, there was an interface from one of these toys that uh, I put the, the keypad for it inside the robot and so you could actually operate it with your tongue. Uh, <laughs> And then later that grew into, I built another robot. I said, well, I need a new robot suit. And so I started this new thing that was even more uh, kind of a, a mix between a silent running robot and a lunar module or something. And, um, and that's the, the very start of it there. Uh, it's made out of um, a foam core that was basically cut it out into the shape I wanted and then covered the thing with fiberglass. Uh, and that's uh, what it ended up looking uh, later on. Um, you know, it was uh, self-supporting. It had a mechanical uh, structure built into the legs so that when you stood up straight, it would actually support its own weight. Um, and it, I put uh, the Amiga 500, I 
cut the power cord off the Omega 500 and made a battery pack that would supply all the voltages to run the thing. And for a while, this had an Omega 500 in it that would make sound effects and do voice synthesis and stuff like that. Um, had built an amplifier to make it loud enough that people could hear it out in the out in the uh, world. And you know, there's all kind of lighting effects and fans and stuff like that. And uh, and my most recent robots have gotten even more sophisticated. Uh, this was a uh, Comic Con uh, costume uh, adventure that we did. And like I say, I, I uh, you know, that, that experience uh, at the small company eventually got me a job at JPL where I spend a lot of time doing this, looking at telemetry and going, what the heck did that just do? Uh, I, uh, I spend a lot of time uh, doing what are called trajectory correction maneuvers. So uh, I'm an attitude control engineer. So I keep the spacecraft pointed in the right direction and uh, am responsible for firing thrusters to correct the spacecraft trajectory. Uh, and you can see uh, there, that's the uh, Curiosity's uh, trajectory from the Earth to Mars. And we have, uh, you know, four or five times uh, there during the mission where we make a little correction to the spacecraft's velocity. Velocity. Uh, that's what the spacecraft looks like in cruise uh, during the flight there. And, uh, you know, space flight operations is really so simple a caveman could do it. I do uh, get to uh, play around with the hardware a little bit. Mostly I work with the spacecraft, uh, with computers and, uh, and doing software sort of stuff. But once in a while we get to do some testing. This is me in the high bay uh, testing the sun sensors on the uh, space side of the spacecraft there. And we've hacked ourselves a, uh, a light there to simulate the sun. And we sit in here and move the light around and have the folks in the control room check to make sure that the right telemetry is is coming out and you know we spent some time goofing around in the high bay um, that's uh, that's the uh, curiosity descent stage behind us there with the with the radar down at the bottom it's kind of hard to see I guess in this light and uh, you've uh, seen me playing around with the theremin here a little bit. I play in a, a band called Artichoke. I, my girlfriend got me this, uh, this theremin as a kit for Christmas one year. She said, you know, you're the kind of person that really needs to have a theremin. And, uh, and she was right. Um, and uh, I, uh, I now goof around with that. Uh, that's us uh, out at some, uh, some party that we were going to. Some of you saw the, uh, the T-Rex head at uh, a recent uh, one of our gatherings over at Congregation Alehouse. So working for NASA, I've gotten to do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, we uh, flew an ion-propelled spacecraft to, to Comet Borelli uh, that you see there. Um, my girlfriend said uh, it looked like a giant chicken leg, which a lot of comets that turn out do. Um, I uh, smashed a, a part of a spacecraft into a comet nucleus, which was kind of exciting, a mission called Deep Impact. Uh, and I was the ACS lead for that. And after we had done that, we flew that same spacecraft to a different comet and flew by that and took pictures, uh, Hartley 2. Um, I always cry at Mars landings. <laughs> But all, all this hacking stuff, you know, really pretty much directly uh, led me into the space thing. I mean, those capabilities and being curious about how hardware works and how software works and digging in and playing with that stuff and teaching myself about it, um, you know, really ended up with a resume that I could take to first a small company and, say, and you know, get them to hire me to do some software development, but you know, it, uh, it, it definitely guided me on my path to working in space stuff. Um, you, in space, you definitely want to be uh, prepared for anything. And, uh, and 
you know, being able to hack uh, together solutions. Uh, ju let me just uh, give one very specific example of that. On the mission that we flew, uh, the ion-propelled spacecraft, it had a, a sensor on it, a star sensor, which is used to figure out the spacecraft's orientation. And it turned out on this spacecraft to save costs, they put just one sensor on it, uh, one of these star scanners. And um, it turned out that it failed in flight. It had a failure, we believe, in the power supply and uh, just quit working one day. And we're like, uh, but we were trying to go to a comet. And so we ended up hacking a solution to that. We figured out that we could use the science camera on the spacecraft to take pictures of stars, actually just a single star, and use that in place of this star camera, uh, which had a much wider field of view. And we, after a year of writing so new software and figuring how to operate the spacecraft with this, with this workaround in place, we were able to fly it uh, to take that uh, picture I just showed you. So um, there is a partial list of the various uh, hacks I've worked on over the years. And uh, let me just leave that up there for a second and, and see if anybody has questions just for a couple of minutes. Am I? Why did you use an Apple II when you could have used a Commodore? Um, for the, um, for, well, the Apple II was, uh, was. Commodore, that's why I'm asking. You're from Commodore. Well, th it wasn't a choice that I made. Let me say it that way. Uh, the Apple II, they had cards, that, the card slots that you could put stuff in. And for the um, lighting board case, somebody had already kind of started the process of doing it. And they said, here, we've got these uh, D to A cards that we're going to use in it. And they go in the Apple II. And so that was sort of given to me as a as a given. But uh, I, I very much appreciate uh, Commodore's work and all the people that supplied the community, you know, um, that uh, did amazing stuff in the Commodore community because a lot of the stuff I learned came straight out of that. I mean, this was pre-internet, right? All this Commodore 64 stuff was when all the information had to come out of like magazines and, you know, weird, you know, Xeroxed uh, mailings that you would get from people. Yeah. Please tell me what the Commodore 64 stuff in the VW Bug looks like. Um, it's, I mean, it sits there in the footwell next to my battery-powered television. Uh, I, I, I put a uh, micro switch in the back of the uh, speedometer so that whenever the odometer clicked over a tenth of a mile, it would click. And then I wired that to the, uh, you know, one of the joystick inputs on the Commodore 64 so it could keep track. And I took the map of my drive from LA to Santa Cruz and I put all the mileages in this big thing so that as I drove along, it would go click, click, click the mileage and then, um, and I could keep track of where I was and how, you know, estimate how long it was going to take me to get to the next gas station. So, so follow-up question. What integer multiple of the trip time did it take you from random direction to? Oh, I, way, you know, a factor of 10 or 100, I, I can't remember now. And I probably spent most of the time heads down, you know, it's like us driving with cell phones now. It's, it, was, it was a reckless thing to do, but I was, you know, 19, so. Uh, other questions? Shoe phone. Shoe phone. Uh, we did a play when I was in high school uh, uh, that was about Get Smart, and we had a bunch of Get Smart things. We made a cone of silence, and we needed to have a shoe phone, and I went and got a shoe somewhere and put a dial in the bottom of it. Yeah. Curly in photography. My my mom was very interested in um, in what would you call it? Uh, uh, you know, ec uh, what do they call it? Uh, you know, extrasensory phenomenon and stuff like that. And I built myself a Tesla coil, which um, I, I was working in a bicycle shop. They had a bunch of glass shelves that they were getting rid of. And I said, oh, those would be a perfect glass plate capacitor. So I got a bunch of aluminum foil and made this giant glass plate capacitor stack. And so I built this Tesla coil and would play around with it in my garage. And uh, um, I had no idea how to tune a Tesla coil or anything. I 
just made a bare spark gap and um, and I was at the same time was playing around with photography and developing my own printing my own uh, photos and stuff like that and I said well there's this curly and photography thing that my mom was talking about well maybe I can put a leaf on a piece of printer paper and zap it with the Tesla coil and see if something interesting happens and it made all kind of kooky corona discharges around the leaves you know and stuff like that so it it did sort of work I don't know if you know what curly and photography is but it's a where you use high voltage electricity to and, and you know back in the day we said oh you can see the soul of a leaf you know you can you know, stuff like that uh, yeah Water up, high voltage generator. Uh, I did not write it up. There are there are stu uh, descriptions of it on online. Um, it, it shocked and terrified me how m easy it was to have you know droplets of water with the right electrical connections make a high voltage. Uh, basically, you know, you take two little streams of water and drop the droplets through little rings with a with a funny little cross connect of the so they sh they uh, build the charge and i'm like why doesn't this happen in like oil refineries and stuff i mean it, things should be blowing up all the time because you can generate you can make a spark an inch long with you know just water dripping out of your uh, faucet so uh mike am i way dead over time are we okay you okay we should thank you very much uh, i'll be floating around if you guys have other questions Steve Collins, everyone, thank you so much. I have great news, uh, some food has arrived. So let's go ahead and take a little bit of intermission right now, uh, get, grab some food, grab some drink, and we'll see you back here in 15 or so.